Good morning and a very warm welcome to this, our service of worship here in Presswick South Parish Church. This is our third Sunday back since reopening and delighted that we are able to do so. And a special welcome this morning to those that are joining us for the live stream wherever they are located, whether it's local, whether it's members of Craigie Simonton, members of Presswick South, or indeed from further afield. We bid everyone a very warm welcome to this service of worship as we embrace the wonders of modern technology. For our first hymn, as we have been doing in the past few weeks, we just remain seated. Uh, the words will be in the screen, and if you wish to either join in or to just listen to the music, it really is what you're comfortable with. But it's a lovely hymn to begin with this morning. The words and the music of For the Beauty of the Earth. beautiful words of for the beauty of the earth. Well, as we cautiously and slowly make our way, hopefully back to a sense of normality, um, after 18 months of lockdown, we are aware that perhaps on Sundays we might not have any young people with us, but um, getting around that, we're, we're all young at heart anyway. And I'd like to speak this morning just as a short address for all ages about something that we will all have had dealings with at one time or another, particularly during times of celebration. Because if we've ever experienced a birthday or 
an anniversary, wedding, whatever, then the chances are that this next item will also have been present. And if there had been children today, I would have asked what they thought I was talking about. And I have to say that one little boy at Symington got it first time. But what I'm actually looking for is a balloon. And I'm sure we've all come across balloons at times. Very much instrumental birthdays, celebrations, uh, things like that. And also, they can give you a fright if some, someone has a pin and they actually stick the pin in it. Uh, and you're unaware of that. So balloons are something we've come across. But balloons come in all shapes and sizes. And I say that because a few years ago, there were a couple of balloonists from America, and they decided to actually go around the world in their balloon. Obviously not a wee balloon, but a huge, huge balloon uh, with a basket at the bottom. So the idea, they would start in America and they would then make their way eastwards around the globe. That was the plan. And therefore, to begin with, they put some gas in the balloon, as you would expect. And once the gas was, was in the balloon, they were able to take off. And initially, they more or less were going up, up, and away. And they reached um, 24,000 feet to begin with. 24,000 feet was what they actually started their journey at in many respects. And that was absolutely fine. 24,000 feet, they were been blowing eastwards, and they were making their way, good progress, etc., and they were hoping that this would enable them to fulfill their dream of going round the globe. However, they approached Europe, and if you're good at geography, you'll be able to see France, Spain, Portugal, the boot of Italy. So everything was going well, and they were going over the Mediterranean, traveling eastwards, and problems kind of struck because they were aware that the course they were taking would take them over the Middle East. Now, there's nothing wrong with that apart from one or two of the countries in the Middle East were a wee bit weary of American balloonists flying overhead. And therefore, the two balloonists thought, you know, if we keep going the way we're going, then we're going to go over some countries that perhaps might not take too kindly to us. And who knows, we may even be shot down, the balloon shot down, and we may be accused of spying. So there was a wee bit of a problem. The balloons flying eastwards towards countries where they weren't sure of the welcome they would get. And so they thought, well, we've got to take some kind of action here. And obviously, if you're in a balloon, you don't have a steering wheel. You can't just turn around and say, oh, we'll go the other way. But if you know anything about ballooning, and I must confess, I don't, but if you know anything about ballooning, you will know that at different altitudes, the wind actually goes in different directions. Did you all know that? I'm glad you all said no to that because it makes me feel not as silly. But yeah, if you are at a different altitude, then you can get different winds. So what they were able to do, they actually dropped from 24,000 feet to 6,000. And they came down to 6,000, obviously letting the sort of gas out the, the balloon, and they came to 6,000 feet. And lo and behold, there was a wind that was going south. So they were able to start traveling south. And they continued traveling south for quite a wee bit um, until they were aware that if they started back eastwards, then they were not going to go above any countries that were perhaps uh, not going to be very welcoming to them. So they went down to 6,000 feet, traveled south for quite a while, and when they were sure that they were in a safe place, they then went back up to 10,000 feet, and they actually then found a wind that was going eastwards again. 
And as a result, they continued on their journey. I wonder if I can just go back. That's it. Back to that one. They continued on their journey. And they were actually able to make it right round the, the globe. They successfully managed to reach America once again. And it was a great joy and a great success that they had successfully accomplished their mission. But it's quite amazing to think that, you know, if you change the altitude in a balloon, then there's a change of direction. And, you know, I suppose in life, we too can be like that. We don't have to change the altitude, but maybe there's another word that comes into play, and that is attitude. Because the balloonists, you could think, were at the mercy of the wind, and they could perhaps have shrugged their shoulders and said, you know, there's not much we can do. But they thought about it, and they responded accordingly, and they had a complete change in altitude, and therefore they were safe. Well, sometimes in life, let's be honest, we need a change of attitude. Sometimes we can be angry. Sometimes we can say that we're going to do things and we don't. And when, you know, we maybe fail in our mission or whether we're saying things that we shouldn't, we sometimes can just very easily just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know what? That's the way I am. That's the way I am. But Sometimes we can have a change of attitude. And to have a change of attitude, we require to focus on something else. And I say that because the Apostle Paul was once in prison. And, you know, you can imagine Paul being in prison. He had every right to be angry. He had probably every right to be sad and frustrated and worried. But he used his time in prison to focus on his beliefs, on the Christian faith, and on following Jesus. And because of that, he spoke of how he was able to find joy in prison. And that's a kind of amazing thing to do, to be in a prison cell and to focus so much in trying to, in a sense, change your attitude that you find joy. And as he said from his prison cell, rejoice in the Lord always. That, I would suggest, is no easy thing to do, especially from a prison cell. But I suppose for all of us, we encounter things in our daily lives where perhaps our attitudes are wrong, perhaps our attitudes are leading us in the wrong direction, and we need to focus on actually trying to overcome our faults and our failings. And I would suggest that if Paul can do that from a prison cell and find joy, then in our daily lives, whether it's our actions, whether it's our words, if we focus enough on our beliefs, then hopefully too, we can find a change not of altitude, but of attitude. Let's have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we are all different. We have our own personalities, our own faults, our own attitudes in life. And therefore, sometimes we can do things that aren't nice. We can speak and utter words that are hurtful and unkind. We can promise to do certain tasks and then we can't be bothered. We can be critical of others instead of offering support and encouragement. And Lord, when we act in such a way, we know that sometimes we can simply shrug our shoulders and claim that is just the way we are. And yet if we follow the ways of Christianity, then Jesus teaches us to follow his guidance, his wisdom, and his examples. Therefore, help us to listen to Jesus, to focus on what he says. And where necessary, may this allow us to seek a change in our attitudes, where we are kind, where we are thoughtful, 
where we present personalities that are good and respected, where we truly are the followers of Jesus. And so hear our prayer this day, Lord God, in your Son's name, for we now come together with a sense of unity to say these words. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we continue with our second hymn. And once again, just remaining seated, either to sing or just to follow the words and music. And the hymn is, All I Once Held Dear. The lovely words of knowing you, Jesus. Um, at the moment, as we <coughs> make our way back into the way of things, there is no printed order of service. But just this morning, just highlighting one or two wee intimations. And that is, I'm sure it would be beneficial if people wanted to once again start contributing to the food banks. During lockdown, we had one or two times when the church was open for private prayer and people were invited to bring along donations and we were overwhelmed with what people brought to the church. So we're going to just maybe start up again the, the food bank. However, I have been told that the one thing the food bank doesn't need at this moment in time is pasta. Um, they apparently have got more pasta in Presswick now than they have in the entire country of Italy. So with no disrespect, no pasta, but if you can bear that in mind. The other thing to say is that we did hope today to have 
the newsletter, the September newsletter, and a yearbook ready for distribution. But we had a wee glitch with COVID this week, which uh, ensured that this wasn't possible. But it will be available for distribution next Sunday. And contained in the newsletter will be a Harvest Thanksgiving envelope and also a Blyswood Care leaflet. So I'll be appealing next Sunday for distributors at the close of the service because I am aware just now that some of our distributors are understandably not yet back at church. So we'll be looking for one or two people next week to maybe help with the distribution of the magazines and the handbooks. And that, in a sense, are the two items which I want to bring to your attention this morning. During the last two weeks, people have been entering church and the offerings have been accepted in the welcome area. And I am conscious that people give to the church in many different ways, standing orders, checks, free will offering, and open plate. And therefore, it would seem appropriate this morning as we reflect on the donations that have been coming in from the different avenues that we come before God and seek to dedicate the offering. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your goodness which surrounds us daily. We also acknowledge that we live in a world where there is a great sense of need and want. Therefore, we simply pray this day that the offerings that we bring before you will indeed ensure not just the continuation of Presswick South and the work we seek to do, but we also pray that the offerings we give from a very unselfish way will help those in need wherever they are to be found in the world. And remind us that when we bring offerings for your dedication, we are in many ways following the ways of Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus came to offer compassion, to offer healing, and to offer kindness to all in need. And so in Jesus' name, we ask that these offerings be dedicated now and used for the benefit of humanity. And this prayer we offer in Christ's name, Amen. And now I am going to hand over to Tom for the rest of our service. Our reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, reading from verses 13 to 20. And this is a very famous passage in which Jesus asks the disciples who the people believe he is and then turns the question around and asks the disciples who do they think he is. And it's at this point that Peter announces that he is the Christ, the Messiah that they had all been waiting for. And Jesus responds by saying that he will build his church on Peter. So let's hear the word of God from Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or other prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say the Son of Man is? You are, and Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Amen, and may God bless this reading from his holy word. This morning I thought I'd take some time out to reflect on my views of what has happened since we went into lockdown in March 2020, and then to look forward, hopefully, with a bit of hope and a bit of excitement about what lies ahead in the future for our church. On Sunday the 23rd of March 2020, Mother's Day, if you remember it well, the First Minister announced that as of the Monday afterwards, we would go into lockdown to help us to deal with the then coronavirus pandemic. Those restrictions that were imposed meant that we couldn't use our church buildings. And as the site says, for many people, it felt as if the church had closed, that the doors of the church had been closed. However, nothing could have been further from the truth. The church never closed. Yes, the restrictions meant the doors were closed and we couldn't use our buildings. But the church never closed. It continued providing all the services we always provided. The church never stopped working. Yes, our doors were closed. We couldn't use our buildings. But we still managed to keep in touch with our community, with our members, through our weekly services, which we did online, all the way through every Sunday. And then we used telephone and Zoom, all these modern technological instruments that you can use. And I've got to admit, I'm still not very good at them. I still make the same fatal flaw every time I go to use Zoom or Teams meetings at work. I always forget to unmute. So you're sitting in your study at home or in my office at work, and I'm talking to the four walls. It got so bad that we decided in our house that every time you did that, you had to put a pound in a glass jar. I'm looking forward to a really good night out with the amount of money that's in that glass jar, most of which, I have to say, is mine. But the church, as I say, never closed because it still carried on caring for others, loving others, but in a slightly different way. We had to find new ways of being church. But like all families and communities, we just didn't give up simply because life became difficult. Yes, we had to change the way we worship God. We had to go online. Yes, we had to change the way we did meetings. We had to go on Zoom. Yes, we had to communicate with others electronically because we couldn't go and meet them in person. We couldn't visit them in their own homes. We couldn't ask them to come and see us at church. But we still managed to keep in touch with one another. We still managed to communicate together and we still managed to meet together. We still looked out for one another. Several years ago, the Church of Scotland launched a program entitled Church Without Walls. It was de designed to encourage people to think of the church not as a beautiful building like Presswick South Church or any other church in the area. You were meant to look at yourself as a faith community, to go out into the community and share our faith. The principle was that the seeds of faith would be scattered out throughout our community, outside the walls of our buildings, and would be spread in our community, and God's kingdom would grow in the community. One of the good things that I think came out of the pandemic, and I don't think there were too many of them, but one of the good things I think that did come out of it was the fact that we, for a period of time, 
had to act as a church without walls. We couldn't come in to our buildings, so we had to act out with our building. <coughs> we were forced to move outside the building and share the good news through our actions, through the internet, and we were able to go and interact with a lot more people than we would normally have. Also, our church services became much wider, to, available to a wider audience. And many churches, including our own, connected with people who we'd probably have never connected with in the past. Last week in his sermon, Kenneth alluded to the fact that some people come to church may have been doing so out of habit. In other words, the church had become a place where people meet and congregate and have some fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, if that's all we do, we miss the main point of the church. Because for me, coming to church is about experiencing God. It's about worshiping Him, about being refreshed and strengthened to continue our work to expand His kingdom out in our community. And all too often, our traditions and our habits of the church obstruct us from spreading the gospel of Jesus into today's world. In a time of dwindling church influence, we need to reinforce to the outside world the good news of the scriptures and how they provide us with a blueprint for helping men and women like you and I to make a difference in this world. And that's why I chose our gospel reading this morning. Because in our scripture reading today, Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Son of Man, the Christ, the Messiah. And what was Jesus' response? Well, I quote, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In this imagery that we get in Matthew's Gospel, we see Peter as a rock. Jesus is highlighting, therefore, for me at least, that the church is made up of living stones. It's not about bricks and mortar or wood or plaster. It's about living stones. It's about people. Jesus never envisaged the church as a building. Jesus didn't create the bureaucracy that surrounds our church today. In fact, as hymn 204 in our church hymnary says, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. The church isn't a building, it's a community of people, it's a family of people. It's not a place that we visit once a week, but it's a community and a family that we all belong to, a community that gathers around Jesus. Jesus, in fact, spent most of his ministry outside the temple in the open air. He went out to meet the people where they were. He didn't rely on them coming to a building for him to carry out his ministry. He went out and he spent his ministry in the open. You could say that Jesus was the first church with no walls. Which brings me nicely onto our question of where is the church heading in the future? Because in the second part of that quote that I gave you from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus made a promise that the church would endure, that the gates of Hades would never overcome it. Now, based on what's happened probably in the last two or three decades, as well as what's happened in the past 18 months, you might think to yourself that that promise is highly unlikely. And when you listen to what was said at this year's General Assembly and at the state of our Church of Scotland, then you would be forgiven for thinking that the future maybe isn't as bright 
as it could be. But Jesus' promise wasn't a claim for numerical size of the church, nor was it a claim that my church, your church, or any church will never change. Change is inevitable. And the church has always dealt with change. The church has changed over 2,000 years. It's constantly evolving. It's changing all the time. But it changes to deal with what's happening in society and to react in a way that it believes that God wants the church to go. Change that's being proposed in the church today is probably the most radical change since the General Assembly of 1929. Now, some of us will thrive on change. Some of us will hate it. Some of us don't like change, but change is part of human life. We deal with change on a daily basis. Things change for us on a daily basis. And there are two ways we can deal with change. We can choose and wait for the change to happen and let it happen to us. Or we can act. We can help form the shape and control the change that we face as we go forward. And in my experience, the latter always has a better outcome. When we get involved in the change and make sure we change for the way we believe the church should change, then the results are always much better than sitting back and let it happen to us. As a church, we need to have faith in God. We need to take time out and to pray for his guidance on the way forward. And then to have the courage and the strength to share that with others and to work together with others to shape the future of our church. Our church will have to change. The status quo is not an option. But that change can be shaped by God's will. As I said earlier, Kenneth alluded to the danger of doing things out of habit. And as I was thinking on that, as I was doing my daily prayers this week, and the fact that I finish my daily prayer every day with the Lord's Prayer, I began to wonder if that was just a bit of a habit. Because how many of us say the Lord's Prayer frequently? How many of us say it maybe even on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis? But how often does that then transform into our actions? If we say the Lord's Prayer then we say the words, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth. And surely if we say that, then we should seek to discern God's will for the future of our church. And then we should do everything in our power to make that happen. Not just sit back and let it happen, but make it happen. Make our church, structure our church, form our church in the way we want it to go forward, believing that's what God wants. After all, we are the church. We are the living stones that gather around Jesus, the Son of the living God. And he demands that even in the darkness of this world, where light seems scarce and hope ever so fragile, that we who confess him as Lord keep hope alive and keep on working for peace and healing among all of God's people. You and I are the foundation stones, the building blocks of God's kingdom. It's our responsibility to maintain hope in a world where there is so much despair. It's our job to share God's love with all we meet in our daily lives. It's our job to make sure as the living stones that gather around Jesus, we remain as the witnesses of God in this world. 
It's our job to discern God's will for the future of our church. And it's our job to bring that future into being. Amen. And now in the quietness of the sanctuary, let us come together in our prayers for others. Let us pray. God, our Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, we bring to you now our prayers for others and our concerns for your world. Lord God, we pray for all those people struck by the horrors of the natural disasters in this world, and especially for those people whose homes and livelihoods have been destroyed by the tornadoes in the United States of America and in Haiti. Lord God, we pray that you will strengthen and encourage all those relief and aid workers striving to help those affected by all such disasters throughout the world. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those countries where war and violent conflicts are raging. And in particular, Father, today we pray for those people suffering as a result of the ongoing conflicts. We pray for an end to hostilities and a start of a lasting peace and reconciliation. We pray for tolerance, not discrimination, for love, not hate, for understanding, not ignorance. And today, Lord, in particular, we pray for the people of Afghanistan, and we pray that the Taliban leaders will, in fact, implement what they say they want to do, and that they will continue to live in peace. Lord God, we pray for those in need in our community, the elderly, the housebound, those in care homes, hospitals, and hospice. And we think also of the rejected, the unloved, the homeless, the offenders, and all those in the margins of our society. And we pray for all those who minister to their needs, both from within their own families from their churches, from other professional and voluntary services. Almighty God, grant them your strength and encouragement. Lord God, we pray for your church throughout the world, but especially here in Scotland, as we look towards an uncertain future, we pray that its leaders, ministers, elders, and members may be guided by you in order to shape the future of your church that it may be structured and equipped to meet the opportunities and the challenges that lie ahead. Lord, may we in all we do seek to do your will and to follow your path whatever it may lead. In loving God, we pray for those we love, our families and friends, and we ask that you strengthen the love we have for them and in this time of silence, we bring to you our prayers for those people known to us who need your help. Loving God, we pray that you will bless those who are dear to us at home or far away, that neither time nor distance may weaken the love that binds us together. And all these prayers we ask in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing praise this morning is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
And now as you leave here, know that God loves you. And in that love, go and serve him by serving others. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Thank you.